Uh, good afternoon. Let me apologize for the late start. Uh, we normally try to get things going on time, but we, we had to get everybody assembled. I'm Steve McDonald. I'm the director of the Africa program and the uh, project on leadership and building state capacity here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. We welcome you all out for this uh, uh, this event today. Uh, I know it's the week after Thanksgiving and it's cold and so we appreciate you all coming. Uh, shows you have a, a, a good dedication to the subject, a subject that's extremely important obviously for the uh, for the continent of Africa and, and all of the rest of the world. Uh, we uh, first of all are here at the Woodrow Wilson Center which as you know is the uh, is the uh, living memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. Uh, the, the key uh, thing to know about that is Wilson as an academic uh, uh, before he went into public life, had a very, very strong commitment to bringing together the, uh, uh, the world of ideas and the world of policy. So he liked to bring together those who worked in the field, the experts, the academics, the practitioners, um, uh, who understood and lived under the rules that policymakers make out there with the world of policy to better inform and engage them. And so these are good examples of the, the kind of things that President Wilson stood for. Uh, today's events entitled the so-called land grabs in the global south reality and repercussions uh, land grab of course is a is a red flag word uh, 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 quite derogatory really uh, it's, it's probably not fair in totality in terms of what is describing what is happening uh, in uh, in the southern hemisphere but we wanted to get everybody's attention so you would come so threw it out there. Um, and in fact, of course, there is an explosion of large-scale transnational uh, commercial land transactions going on all around the world. Uh, there have been strong reactions from states, corporations, civil society groups, some who see land grabs as a major threat to the lives and livelihoods of the rural poor and therefore oppose such commercial land deals. Others see <coughs> economic opportunity and call for improving land, mar land market governance. Critics charge that rich countries are buying poor countries soil, fertility, water, and sun to ship food and fuel back home. Sort of a neo-colonial dynamic. And of course, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the area of the world that we're most concerned about here in the Africa program, is where 70% of all the land grabs in the world are located. There, the major uh, uh, um, uh, grabbers of the land are China, India, South Korea, and the Gulf Arab states. Interestingly, in Latin America, where this is going on as well, the primary land acquisition comes from the United States and Europe. So no one is, uh, no one is blameless in this. But to exemplify uh, how serious it is in Africa, and I think we'll hear some more about this in the, uh, in the coming presentations, uh, a February BBC report uh, said that as of March the 1st, 2012, land deals as a percentage of arable agricultural land uh, were as follows. In the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, 48.8% of the land has been acquired by foreign, or has been uh, given access to by foreign uh, entities. In Mozambique, that's 21.1%. Uganda, it's 14.6%. Zambia, 88 Ethiopia, 82 Madagascar, 67 Malawi, 62 Mali, 61 Senegal even, 5.9, Tanzania 5%, and etc. So you can see it's a huge, huge issue. Um, so it's obviously a question that needs to be examined seriously in, in, all, in all its dimensions and its pros and its cons. And that is our purpose here today. We have three experts to help lead us through this discussion. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce all three of them now. Uh, and then they will present as in the order that, they're, that they are going to present. Uh, and, I, and I won't have further in, uh, uh, introduction of the individuals. Uh, they will present from the podium here, and then we'll open up for questions and answers uh, uh, when they are finished. Our first presenter is going to be, I'm not going to go through their entire bios because you have them in front of you, but it's Carol Boudreau, who's the Africa Land Tenure Specialist and pro in the Land Tenure and Property Rights Division at USAID. Uh, she's been working on this for a very long time, and she was an instructor at George Mason University School of Law and a research fellow at the Marquettes uh, Center at George Mason University. Um, so we welcome Carol, and she'll be our first presenter. And then we're going to have Michael Klugelman, who's a, a colleague of mine here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. He's a senior program associate for our South and Southeast Asia program. And again, you have his bio in front of you. Um, uh, he's widely published and has done a lot of work, but uh, uh, this problem is not just limited to Africa, as I said. And he has recently published uh, with a co-authored a book called The Global Farms Race, Land Grabs, Agricultural Investment, and the Scramble for Food Security, which is being uh, published in 2013. 
Um, and uh, then he had another one on this subject, reaping the dividend overcoming Pakistan's uh, democratic challenges and India's contemporary security challenges. No, that's not on the same subject. But Michael is going to have next week on December the 4th a book launch for his Global Farms Race book. So you're all welcome to come to that uh, event as well, which should be very, very interesting. And then our last presenter is going to be Aubang Meto, who's the founder and executive director of the Solidarity Movement for a New Ethiopia. He's going to be focused mostly on Ethiopia, which is one of the countries where this is really playing out. And again, you have his bio in front of you, but uh, uh, he's, uh, uh, he's uh, appeared on various radio programs and, and other public appearances on this, uh, this issue. And we're very happy to have uh, Obang with us today. So with no further ado, let me have Carol come on up and start us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today at the Wilson Center. Uh, it's my first, my first time here, which means I don't know how to work the clicker. So bear with me for just a moment. <laughs> Technical assistance is coming. Technical assistance is needed. We need a 14-year-old. They can always solve the problems. <laughs> Nothing. <coughs> well, maybe I'll start by saying um, that I am just back from Mozambique uh, doing some work there. And uh, I can tell you that in Mozambique, this issue is uh, very much a concern for civil society members, NGOs, um, but as well for investors, uh, and we'll ta I'll talk a little bit about why this issue is a concern from both sides of the equation. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, wait, clicker. Just a second. Oh, oh, okay. I'll just hit the button. That'll be fine. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why this issue is a concern uh, for many of the, for all stakeholders, really, who are involved in the process. Oh, it's going to go all the ones now. Okay, so um, I get a Google feed every day, then my Google feed is, or a Google alert is land rights. And what you see on the screen are some recent headlines that have come into my Google land rights feed. Uh, this is a, and, and the only reason to show you this is to point out that this issue is in fact very live in Sub-Saharan Africa, but it's an issue that really is, um, thank you so much is impacting people in many different countries. So you see a headline from Cambodia, for example. Um, and, it, and because it's affecting people in many different areas and affecting communities in many different areas, it's an issue that we within USAID are addressing increasingly. Uh-oh, now I made it go away. Okay, so what are the sources of concern? What's driving land grabbing, um, or as we prefer to say, large-scale land acquisitions? Well, here are some of the uh, driving factors, and you'll be familiar with all of them. It's not like this hasn't been discussed in many other studies. You can look at any number of studies on this topic over the last three to four years, and you would find people pointing out the same sorts of things. Um, what it all comes down to is that there's increasing demand for arable land. There's increasing demand for land that has water access, um, increasing demand for, ir for irrigation opportunities driven by uh, rising interest in biofuel production, whether that's from European countries, um, mostly from European countries. Strong demand for agricultural land, and this would be especially from the sorts of investors that were just mentioned, uh, companies or, or sovereign wealth funds in the Middle East, but as well investors from uh, Asia who are looking for opportunities to grow food not for sale in local markets, but for export back to home markets. There are significant investments going on in the timber and forestry sector. Um, this is particularly notable in Mozambique, where most of the concessions that are being offered are being um, taken up by timber and forestry companies. Also extractives, Mozambique again, I'll, I'll refer to it because I've just been there, so it's really fresh on my mind. A lot of concessions are being given out to extractive industries, whether this is for natural gas or for coal production. Um, but, but remember, there's also other competing um, demands on land. So it's not just that there are private sector commercial 
actors who are wanting to get access to land in areas. There are also NGOs wanting land for things like conservation purposes to set aside so the lands in fact won't be developed and they'll remain um, wild. And then there's the whole phenomenon of urban expansion. Africa is rapidly urbanizing, and as cities expand, there's a demand to use land in peri-urban areas, and so more land comes under, comes under demand for uh, habitation purposes as well. So, so why, do, why are we concerned about um, these demands? In, a, in, a, in some environments, like our environment, when you have com competing demands for land, how do you sort out that competition? Well, normally land gets allocated through a market process. And um, the person who values the, the resource or asset most highly will normally be able to purchase the asset in a voluntary transaction with a seller. Does this happen in these countries? Well, oftentimes this is not what's happening in these countries. In most sub-Saharan African countries, the government is the owner, radical title holder of the land. And it's the government, government officials who are entering into agreements or concession agreements, lease agreements with investors who want to have access to available arable land or lands with water on them. We're concerned about this process. We, broadly speaking, are concerned about this process because in many cases, though not in all cases, in many cases there is a poor consultation process that is undertaken when investors legally receive rights to use land from a host government or a national government, but investors may not understand what is required in order to properly consult with local communities who have traditional or even legal use rights to the land. Um, so poor consultation, poor engagement with communities is a major concern that's driving conflict in some areas. But at the heart of all this is really a concern around weak land governance throughout, I'll just focus on, on Sub-Saharan Africa, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, weak land governance systems and institutions are compounding problems around the allocation of very large tracts of land to investors. I think it's reasonable for us to say that most people, probably a majority of people who, who are involved in this issue recognize there is in fact a legitimate and strong need for private sector investment in sub-Saharan Africa in order to help promote increased agricultural productivity, in order to better take it, in order to better develop some of the natural resources that exist on the continent. The question is not, is investment always good, always bad? The question really that we think about quite often is how can we channel investment so that it's doing the most to help communities on the ground? And in order to do that, what typically needs to happen is to provide stronger rights to communities to engage directly with investors in beneficial contracting arrangements. But right now what we have are weak land governance systems. We have countries that lack capacity to manage, administer their land, to engage in land use planning, even to do things like produce <coughs> accurate maps. Uh, we have a fair amount of rent seeking in this sector. We should just be probably honest about that. This is a, this is an, a sector where there are increasingly large amounts of money flowing into countries in order to get access to resources. And unless you have a real uh, emphasis on transparent deal making, it's easy for some of these deals to, to lead to rent seeking from the public sector. So where's land being purchased? I have somewhat different figures. Uh, on where land is being purchased coming from a recent Oxfam report called Our Land, Our Lives. This just shows you that um, the majority, whether it's 70 million hectares or 50 million hectares, and, and there's difference in terms of the numbers because it's really hard to track where the deals are happening and the, and the quantity of land involved in the deals. But um, what you can see here is that the majority of the deal making is happening in sub-Saharan Africa. Why is that? Because, well, there is a fair amount of arable land available, available in air quotes, in sub-Saharan Africa. It's inexpensive compared to acquiring land in other areas. And in part, it's inexpensive precisely because of that weak governance system that is not able to really effectively capture the value of land, either, either for the government or for communities on the ground. Um, so let me talk a little bit about a little bit more about land governance and um, talk about what makes it a challenge to deal in, to deal with 
problems in the land sector, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. The first thing that makes it really a challenge is that unlike, say, in the United States, maybe, or unlike in some other countries, um, there is a real challenge around legal pluralism in sub-Saharan Africa, which means what? It means that there is one set of laws, a formal set of laws dealing with land that are, in ca that are contained in uh, statute books and in constitutions and that are supposed to be enforced by the formal judicial uh, sector uh, and enforced by ministries. However, that law is really not the law that's applicable to most people on the ground because there's a parallel customary legal system operating at the same time. And these two legal systems don't necessarily talk well or play well with each other. And so sometimes you've got situations in which um, traditional authorities may have de facto control over land, oftentimes do have de facto control over land, de facto authority to allocate land. But then the government will come in, government officials will come in and make different decisions about how land should be used, how land should be allocated, to whom land should be allocated. So you've got, you've got a real problem with not having appropriate levels of communication uh, and coordination between the formal legal system and the customary legal system. Um, you have a lot of lack of capacity, few numbers of surveyors in, in countries, uh, limited ability to engage in land zoning activities, limited numbers of people who are graduates with land management degrees. So a real, a real problem in terms of a professional management of the land environment in companies. And you certainly have vested interests. There's some very nice work that's been done on the topic of why the wealthy might prefer to have insecure property rights in countries. The reason why some vested interests might prefer there to be ambiguous or unclear property rights rules and regimes is because they tend to benefit from that lack of clarity and that ambiguity. They have deep enough pockets to use legal language. They have deep enough pockets to protect their own resources. Um, but can take advantage of ambiguities to accumulate more properties. And so it, it's, in, it's incumbent upon us to think about how we can move forward with proposals to reform land administration, land use efforts in sub-Saharan Africa that will deal with this problem, because this is, this is a very tough problem to deal with. These problems are even worse for women, and I'll just very briefly talk about the problems for women. Uh, in the areas where I work, I see women as being triply vulnerable. I see them as being vulnerable under customary legal systems where their rights uh, t can easily be um, uh, not protected. In the past, maybe, maybe more so, but in current, under current customary systems, women have weak rights to land and other resources. They're also vulnerable from their national governments, though, who may have acceded to international documents providing legal equality for women, or who may have constitutions or national laws that provide for gender equality, but who don't enforce those laws. And then finally, they're vulnerable to investors who do not understand they may be well-intentioned, but they don't understand that women hold very valuable secondary and tertiary rights to land and resources. And so by entering into contracts with male heads of households, what you may in fact be doing is extinguishing really valuable rights that women hold that allow them to produce for their families, earn income that can then be used to support their children. Here are some of the impacts that I've been seeing um, uh, related to large-scale acquisitions of land in sub-Saharan Africa. Women lose their rights to land. They lose their rights to resources like firewood. They, they lose access, easier access to water resources, <coughs> which means they have to mo walk much further in order to gather wood or water during the course of the day, which makes it harder for them to do what they need to do during the day to feed their kids, feed their husbands, and they become displaced from really valuable social networks that help them take care of their family needs in a reasonable kind of way. So they're increasingly vulnerable from some displacements that are happening. So here are some responses, and really this is why I'm here today, is to talk with you about some recent responses to these concerns. There are real concerns on the ground around large-scale land acquisitions. So what has the international response been? What is the private sector response been to these concerns? Here are just a few of the responses. At the international level, probably the most prominent response is the, recent, the recently developed voluntary guidelines. This is a long title, so bear with me for a second. Voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure of land, fisheries, and forests 
in the context of national food security. So new and soft international law document that I'm going to talk about in some detail. But as well, the G8's new alliance for food security and nutrition in Africa has a strong focus on strengthening land rights at the community level and engaging in more collaborative contracting with smallholder farmers and commercial investors. The farmland principles in the ISO 26,000 uh, are private sector responses to this phenomenon. The private sector coming forward and saying, here's how we should be dealing with problems related to investing in land. Here are the obligations we have. And the RAI, of course, are the new responsible ag investment negotiations that are going on in Rome now. So let me talk about the VGs for a moment, sometimes called the VGGTs. Uh, this is new soft international law. It's voluntary. It's non-binding. Um, it was developed at the uh, committee for under the Committee for Food Security process uh, through a very participatory process that included CSO involvement in the negotiations of the document. Um, the main principles of the document are and are that we need the the folks who have signed on to the document, and it was unanimously adopted by 96 countries in May of this year. The guidance is we need to respect and recognize the legitimate rights of people on the ground, whether those rights have been formalized or not. So there's a strong emphasis on recognizing customary rights to property. Uh, there's a strong emphasis on safeguarding communities from the kinds of harms that we have seen in the past associated with some large scale acquisitions. Uh, there's an emphasis on facilitating more, um, uh, more, more of a win-win engagement with the private sector, improving access to justice, and then in many, in some cases, these acquisitions are leading to conflicts. We know that. And so if, if acquisitions can be done in a more transparent manner, if public administration of land can be done in a way that's providing services to people, all users of land, we may be able to limit some of the conflict associated with this process. Okay, so, so the VGGT is really responding to all the concerns around large-scale land acquisitions, but, but in this context of national food security, so that we can be promoting access to food for people in countries. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Here's my one awful PowerPoint slide that you're never supposed to, right? You're never supposed to have slides like this. So I'm not going to talk about all this stuff. I'm just going to point out to you some of the important provisions of the VGs. If you would like to see the text of the document, it's available online in six different languages at the FAO's website. So it is available in English and it's very readable. It's a very accessible document. Um, but what it, what it commits in a soft law way, what it commits governments to doing, and this is really important, this is the first time there's been international agreement, large, broad international agreement on what's necessary to improve the land, the, the way we govern land and fisheries and forests. Number one, you have to improve service access for people. You've got to make land administration services less expensive, um, you have to make them available in more regional and local environments, not just have the services provided in the capital city, and, and it costs hundreds of dollars for people to get a, a use certificate or a title document. Um, there is a focus on corruption. This is one of those sectors, depending upon the country you're in, where there is actually a lot of corruption associated with land transactions. And there's a strong emphasis on improving transparency and accountability. Uh, but also promoting responsible investment. What does responsible investment mean? There's a whole negotiation going on at the FAO right now about what responsible investing means. And, and we, we could, in question and answer, talk about that a little bit more. I had touched earlier on the problem of valuation. In countries where the government owns all the land and you may or may not have rights to transact leaseholds, it's hard to figure out what land is worth. And so in some countries, it's hard for investors to go in and understand what they're supposed to be paying to communities if the land is, is subject to this kind of unusual for most, most developed world investors, unusual system where you don't really have market prices to determine what a plot of land is worth. So you have to pay people based on the number of cashew trees they have planted or based on the value of their perennial crops. Well, this is, this is really problematic. Communities are not getting the kinds of benefits that they should be getting, but in part it's because there are not reasonable valuation systems set up in countries. Uh, so just to talk a little bit about, okay, what's next with the VGs? Now we've got this really interesting new international law document. So what? 
what's going to happen? Is it, is it people just going to put it on a shelf and forget about it, which is what happens with a lot of stuff? Well, hopefully that's not what happens. And, and I think um, the land tenure uh, folks and specialists around the world are really hoping that we've got a great window of opportunity now to really push for, argue for, advocate for positive changes. Um, and maybe the new alliance commitments give us one wonderful window of opportunity to work in six different countries, the six different new alliance countries, with our partners in, in government to try to improve capacity, improve transparency, and engage in more collaborative contracting with with uh, communities. There will be efforts to implement both bilaterally, so the US government will engage in efforts to implement the voluntary guidelines, and some of those efforts may come through USAID's work. There'll be multilateral efforts to implement. The FAO, for example, is looking at new projects in Mozambique to train government officials. What, is the, what do the VGs really mean? Um, so that we get a clearer sense on the ground of what this document is actually going to bring to communities. What is it going to bring to the private sector? Is it going to bring more clarity to private sector investors who really have been asking repeatedly, at least to US, uh, to US, some USG officials, they've been asking for guidance. How do we invest in a more reasonable way? How do we engage with communities? Think for a moment about being an investor and having to engage with a community of 10,000 people. With whom do you negotiate? Who speaks for the community? How do you have certainty that you've really captured the needs of that community? Do you talk to all 10,000 people? Those transactions costs can be quite substantial for private sector investors. Even a responsible investor feels a bit overwhelmed sometimes by what's required in those situations. But the private sector can definitely do more to help on this front. And really, I think this is where we have a wonderful opportunity to reach out and talk with the companies, especially the U.S. companies that are investing in other parts of the world, they need to understand that the property environment is complex in these countries and that what seems to be legal on its face may not be sufficient in terms of meeting community needs and community expectations. Um, I think our private sector partners can actually be strong advocates for women's land and resource rights on the ground. We've seen some language to this effect from the B20 already, and that's very encouraging because women are the main producers of food in much of sub-Saharan Africa. So protecting their rights to land and resources will help them feed their families and accomplish our goals of having a more food secure environment. Um, but they need some help also in thinking about how do we create viable collaborative contracts and partnerships with local people. So what else is needed? There's a bunch of other stuff that's needed. Let me go through this very quickly. Um, what I see is that there's a strong need for additional use of technology. We've got all sorts of great low-cost technologies available to us. It would be wonderful to get more of that technology, whether it's GPS or other technologies, into the hands of community members so they can identify their community land boundaries, mark out those boundaries, and then um, provide information data to government officials about where their boundaries are. That's just one example. And you can see some of the other needs. I do think there's a strong need to continue to provide civil society and NGO support to assist communities, particularly in negotiations with private sector investors to build the capacity of communities to engage in a more, um, a more uh, kind of equal playing field in those negotiations. So I'll end with what is USAID doing in this front? Well, I can tell you, we spend a heck of a lot of time thinking about this issue uh, in the land tenure and resource management division. Um, this is probably the, the issue that, eats, that takes up most of my time at the moment, uh, working with our Bureau of Food Security as well. So we're assisting efforts to secure land rights around the world. We work in 20 different countries, and typically what we're trying to do is work with our government partners to agree to recognize the rights of traditional users of land and other resources. So devolve rights down to lower levels so that people have some meaningful say and control over the resources. Uh, that, that they're using and that they depend upon for their livelihood. And, and we are also supporting new alliance efforts related to land, um, and as well, excited about the opportunity to create new projects to implement the voluntary guidelines. So I can talk about that in more detail in question and answer. Uh, I'll conclude with that. And um, I'm not sure if I should press the button and we'll go. I don't know where we'll go. Oh, OK, we'll go there. Yeah, for more information, please visit our website. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shaka.
<laughs> okay, Michael, from, from the podium, are you? Steve, many thanks. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure to collaborate with fellow uh, regional programs here at the center. So as a member of the Asia program, I welcome this opportunity to participate in this <coughs> Africa program event, particularly as my new book happens to focus on the very topic of uh, today's discussion, only in a more uh, global context. Very briefly, the book, Global Farms Race, is a, <coughs> an edited volume. Uh, it contains chapters on historical precedents, Incidentally, this is not a new issue, what we're talking about. It's been around for many centuries. Uh, the book has chapters on policy issues, on social, economic, and environmental impacts of the issue. It also contains four regional case studies. One of them is Africa. There's also one on Asia, uh, one on Latin America, and then one on the former Soviet Union states. Collectively, those four regions are really where much of this, uh, these land deals are occurring. Uh, incidentally, they're starting to happen a bit more in New Zealand and Australia as well, uh, but that's uh, not, not featured in the book, not too much there, at least not now. The contributors come from across the spectrum. They bring very different views to what is really a very polarizing uh, topic. We have an academic, an investor, advisor, several farmers, and several food and agriculture experts uh, based at international organizations. They represent nine countries from across the developed and developing worlds. And uh, the book, again, as Steve said, will be launched here in this room uh, on the afternoon of December 4th. And there are flyers outside. We'd love to have you. Um, I hate to state the obvious, especially because it's already been stated, but let me just do so briefly anyway. This land grab, quote-unquote land grab phenomenon, is not exclusively an Africa-focused phenomenon. Africa is certainly where the majority of the land is being acquired. Let me throw out a, just a few uh, data, a few stats here. Um, that differ a bit from the ones Carol provided, but I think that's because these cover uh, deals that are still under negotiation and not necessarily those that have actually been completed. Of the 200 plus million hectares of farmland deals approved or under negotiation between 2000 and 2010, 134 million are in Africa. This is according to the International Land Coalition. Between 2004 and 2009, according to the World Bank, uh, nearly 10 million hectares were acquired in four African nations alone, one of them being Ethiopia, uh, the other three, Liberia, Mozambique, and Sudan. Uh, a, stu a study released by the UN just this past summer concludes that 2.5 million hectares have been acquired in just five countries, Ghana, Ethiopia, Madagascar, Mali, and Sudan, including almost 1.5 million hectares in Sudan alone. Our book has identified 10 different deals of at least 100,000 hectares each. Six of them uh, are in Africa, including the largest one of all, which is, believe it or not, 6 million hectares uh, involving, incidentally, Brazilian investment in Mozambique. Incidentally, I should say I'm using hectares here. Uh, the book has a weakness for the metric system. I believe one hectare is about... 2.5 acres, if I'm not mistaken, so just to keep that in mind. Um, that said, all that said, this trend is also very prevalent in Asia, Latin America, and the former Soviet Union states. The Global Farms Race, uh, my new book, contains case studies of each of these regions. Again, um, I'm not going to talk about the Africa case study now. The main themes have already been covered and will be continue to be covered, but I'm happy to take questions uh, about it later. What I'll instead do is simply compare and contrast what we see in the Africa context with what we see in each of these, uh, those other three regions based on material in the global farms race. So first, to talk about Asia. Asia is the second most popular target for farmland investment, about 45 million hectares worth of land deals, according to the data uh, provided in our book. The most popular countries for investment are Cambodia, which we've already heard about, Indonesia, Laos, and the Philippines, along with uh, Vietnam. There have been three deals in Asia, two in the Philippines, one in Indonesia, of at least one million hectares each. Um, so how does the Asia case study resemble that of Africa? It does so in many ways. There are very real fears of displacement, and there has been actual displacement, as documented in our, in our book. In Cambodia, 
Foreign investors have cleared land previously used for local food crops and livestock grazing. Uh, more than a thousand families have been affected, and smallholders speak of having lost their land without being compensated. Also, um, as in Africa, there are concerns, very real concerns, I think, about conflict potential. Uh, in Asia, one of the biggest acquisitions involves the Saudi Bin Laden Group, uh, investment group from uh, Saudi Arabia, which has acquired uh, over more than a million hectares in Indi Indonesia's uh, Papua province. This is an area that is embroiled in an ethnic uh, separatist insurgency led by ethnic uh, Papuans. There are fears of this Saudi firm bringing in non-ethnic non Papua farm laborers and of this influx of laborers fueling uh, more ethnic strife. Now there's one major difference between uh, land acquisitions in Africa and in Asia. In Asia, investments are mostly intra-regional. About three quarters of them have been made by investors hailing from elsewhere in Asia. By contrast, Asians, Americans, Europeans, along with Africans, are heavily involved in uh, investment projects in the Africa region. Um, second, let's turn to Latin America very briefly. Um, there have been about 20 million hectares worth of deals here, according to our, uh, according to our data in, in the book. According to the World Bank, Latin America and the Caribbean countries combined contain more, I quote the term from the World Bank, more available cultivable land, unquote, than any region in the world outside of Africa. Argentina and Brazil are the most highly sought after. Um, came across a, an Argentinian study recently that claimed that foreigners own about 11% of productive land in that country. This is Argentina. In Latin America, there are some similarities with Africa. There has been encroachment on land, and there's been some displacement, particularly in Colombia and Ecuador. Um, I would argue, though, that the similarities really end there. Uh, in, in Latin America, there are some considerable sharp differences with the Africa case. First, investments tend to be concentrated in the purchase of shares in companies that hold land, rather than in direct acquisition of land. One interesting example Harvard University uh, has invested uh, in many shares, uh, stocks, assets, shares, dealing with timberland uh, in, um, in Latin America. The Oakland Institute had come out with a report focusing on this a few years ago, um, but uh, more recently, media reports, major uh, mainstream media have been focusing on this as well. Um, second, as in Asia, most of the investment is intra-regional. I think Steve had mentioned that before. Third, uh, third difference between Asia, uh, pardon me, Africa and Latin America, and here we veer into somewhat controversial territory, so people should feel free to uh, uh, respond if they feel differently. In Latin America, the social impacts and the social risks, um, generally bad things, the risk of bad things happening, coming out of these land deals, really have not been as significant, not as serious, at least not yet. The rural poor have been displaced, in some cases, but there has not been as much as uh, we've seen or could happen uh, as we expect to happen in Africa. There's been relatively little impact on food production and food security as of yet. This is because most deals in Latin America do not involve staple crops, uh, unlike in other regions. They tend to focus more on biofuels, non-food related crops. Um, and most of, the, most of the deals in Latin America also have occurred in sparsely uh, relatively sparsely populated areas. Environmental impacts are minimal as well so far. Land use change has not caused too much, well, land use change has not caused as much deforestation or does not threaten as much deforestation as it does in uh, Asia and Africa, according to our book. And water footprints uh, involved in these deals and the farming involved are modest compared to those other regions. Now comp contrast this with Africa and Asia where According to our, uh, the environmental impacts chapter in the book, forest conversions to oil palm production have caused considerable deforestation and major destruction of several um, species of animals. In Malaysia, just to take one example, um, these conversions of forest conversions to oil palm production have led to the destruction of 60% of an entire local uh, bird species. And I think oil palm is important here. Oil palm is one of the major crops involved in these deals across the board. 
Um, and it really does have a lot of environmental risks, though, as it turns out now, at least not as much in, in Latin America. And finally, I'll turn to the former Soviet Union countries, which is interesting, somewhat of a wild card. Um, it has an interesting history. After the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 1990s, uh, foreign investors rushed to claim formerly state-owned farms, and this is the, essentially the process that continues to play out today. Investors are attracted to the quality of the land in this part of the world, which is particularly uh, nutrient-rich. The soils, the surface soils, are particularly nutrient-rich. This, incidentally, is also the case in Latin America. Um, most of the land acquisitions happening in this part of the world are happening in Russia and Ukraine. This is a tough regional case to compare with the Africa region. There really are not that many similarities at all. Uh, our book research did not uncover many cases of harmful impacts on local communities or even much controversy. And the individual that, who wrote this, this case study chapter essentially argued that um, this is because foreign land acquisitions have been happening for quite some time. They are in fact strongly encouraged by many people and are therefore less controversial. And I think that we also need to acknowledge the relatively uh, benign practices of investors in this, in this part of the world. Um, the Chinese, for example, uh, on several farms that they run in Russia, um, Russians who happen to walk by are often given free handouts of food, which is not something that happens in a lot of these other cases, in a lot of other regional contexts. There are some, there are some smallholder groups that oppose these deals, but they are not very well organized. Um, they're not particularly visible, and they're not really that powerful. Um, and this, of course, is different from some of the groups uh, that that one uh, that there are in, in Africa and Asia and in, in Latin America as well. Um, and finally, I think it bears mentioning that several countries in this region have very strong laws on the book that forbid foreign ownership of land. And unlike in other regions, the laws are quite robustly enforced. So I will let me just I'll conclude on a rather sobering note. Um, one of the starkest differences, um, we think, in, in the book between these three regions and Africa is really in responses. Uh, Argentina and Brazil um, have just recently passed laws to limit foreign land ownership. Cambodia and Laos have even declared freezes on new land concessions. Of course, if those are actually implemented and anything comes of them, that's another story. But they've, these things have happened. Um, what we've concluded, at least to this point, is that such uh, robust responses from national governments in Africa, those governments hosting these investments, um, r so far as we can see, have not been quite as common, at least not yet. I think that's something to consider. So I will uh, conclude there. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. OK, Obama. OK. I think we're going to start with a little film here by, uh, by Obama. Where's our 14 year old when we need him? <laughs> I know. I should have brought him along. <laughs> okay. This is Ethiopia, one of the hungriest countries in the world. But here, foreign companies are spending billions of dollars to grow food for export. An area the size of Britain has been handed over to corporations in the last three years. It's called a land rush. I'm in Ethiopia's remote southwest Gambella region to investigate claims that large numbers of small farmers are being moved off their land by the government. Now all this land for the next hour of our driving is going to be uh, some kind of farming, intensive industrial agriculture. We're driving west through Karaturi Farm, a new Indian venture, where large areas of forest are already being cleared to grow palm oil, rice, and sugar. Are you going there? Hello. Hello. Thank you. 
It will be one of the largest farms in Africa, but most of the food will be exported. Populations are growing, so this has to be good for the world. But what about Ethiopia's poor? The man in charge is Kamjid Shekhan. So how big will this whole farm be? Phase one, 100,000 hectares. After that? After the second phase, 100,000 plus 200,000. So 300,000 hectares. hectares. And if I started walking at one end, how long would it take me to get to the other end? Uh, 100,000 hectares is about 121 kilometers. 120 kilometers, that's 80, 90 miles. Uh, 90 miles. That's big. Yeah. It's as big as Wales. So will you, will you plant, will you build a town just by here? Yes. Do you see that, those trees? Yes. There will be the town, uh, next camp come, coming up. So that will be camp two and that will be 10,000 people? Maybe 10 to 15,000. Karaturi says it will build home schools and clinics for as many as 60,000 workers. But on one of their other Ethiopian farms, similar promises made by the government have yet to be fulfilled. In addition, we found they pay most workers under a dollar a day. That's well below what the World Bank says is extreme poverty. I think, you see, I think that you've, because you were the first people here, you've got the best land. I think you've got the, the river it, we, we never saw the land. Yeah, oh, you never saw it? <laughs> they gave it to us, we took it. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> Seriously. You did not even see it? Yes. They we, offered it to uh, you? They offered, that's all. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Hi, this has to be the deal of the century. 1,000 square miles for just 150 pounds a week. Plus, they get tax breaks and roads built for them by the government. Now, presumably, all, all the trees, all the forests which yeah. we see at the moment will have to come down so yeah. you can plant them. Yes. Yeah. Is that inevitable or is that just... It's, it's inevitable. Yeah. You have to yeah. clear the... Yeah. Yeah. Then there has, there has to be a road network. Yes, yes, for yes. harvest. So it's very mechanised, it's very industrialised, it's very and precise. You, you. Karaturi says their land was sparsely populated and denied displacing local villagers. On the way back to Gambella town, we passed a group of shacks along the side of the road, near where other foreign companies are moving in. This is Kami village, which we think is full of displaced people, but uh, we'll see. Well, these people clearly haven't been here for very long. These are very rudimentary tents. Around 250 people have been living here for eight months. Chief, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you very much indeed. And most of the people here are displaced from other areas. Why, why did they have to move? The government moved these people and told them they would get a health clinic, a school, as well as fresh drinking water. So far, only the foundations have been dug. Okay, these people are pastoralists. They're quite used to moving backwards and forwards across land. Um, what they don't realize is this land may be taken away from them forever. That would be very different for them. I'm going to the state government to find out how many companies have come to Gambella. Hello, hello. And we want to know how many people will be affected by the land rush. We've got three maps here in the investment office. This is the extraordinary map because it shows that for the last, for, for 10 years, 12 years, there's been just about nothing. In 2007, it started going right up. Since then, there have been hundreds, and I've just been told that the total number of investors in Gambella region is 896. Now, that is an extraordinary figure from absolutely nothing only 10 years ago. Kasahun Zefu is one of the department's senior officials. What countries are they coming from? India, uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, China, and so forth. Can you explain why you are relocating villages? We uh, uh, we relocate the villagers to obtain uh, clean water in one place, to obtain uh, uh, medical services. So the two things are very separate. One is the relocation, the deliberate relocation of villages. Yeah. And the second thing is the investment by the uh, the foreigners. And the two have no link, whatever. There is no, there is no okay. link, yeah. So it's a coincidence yeah. that yeah. villages are relocating? Yes. Yes. 
Yeah. So the villagers, when they relocate, can they go back to their land? No. They can't go back to their land. Yeah. So it is because it's the land voluntary, the voluntary relocation. It's all voluntary. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. right. Kasahun said as many as 15,000 people are being moved. But at the same time, thousands of square miles is being cleared. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's Steve, thank mm -hmm. you for uh, inviting me to be here and also the speaker before me. Uh, I don't think I could say more than what they have said, you know, because uh, Karen said exactly what I had, <laughs> and Michael follow up, and then I'm now, I don't know what more to say. Uh, but in any case, the land grab is a very, very serious thing that we can talk. I usually talk about it, not land grab, it's live grab. Because if you look at it, by the what you've seen in the picture there, the Indian gentlemen say that they give it to us and we took it. He didn't even acknowledge that someone was living in that land. From the people who spoke before me, this land rush started more after 2008, when there was food shortage around the world. Mm -hmm. And there were some places. The investors seen that as an opportunity. In the next few years, we have you know, almost 9 billion human beings that need to be fed. And they have to look for where the land is. And the number one place where there's untapped land resource is Africa. I'm speaking as a son of Africa and as an Ethiopian. And the Gambela region of Ethiopia, where those people are, that's where I was born, is the epicenter of the land grab. Ethiopia, to almost everyone, including you in this room, is being known for the starvation. A country that is known for not feeding themselves, but they can feed their people by the food head from the West or from other countries. Just not because the Ethiopian did not have a land. If they can have a land to give to this Indian or the Arab, the Chinese, the Saudi to come, why did the Ethiopian not use this land to feed the Ethiopian people? I can go more and say that as an African, in 1950, Africans used to feed themselves than they are today. Something has went wrong. And I would like to emphasize this. I am not speaking as anti-investment. But I am anti-daylight robbery. <laughs> What's going on in Africa is a, a robbery. I usually give a name for it. I call it the second scramble for Africa. Someone may ask me, why do you say the second? This is not the first time that the outsider came looking for a resource in Africa. The first resource was wanted in the continent was not oil, was not land grab, was not diamonds. It was human being. Sometimes it's good to go back and tell our story, the dark story that we had as a human. That followed by dividing the continents. Usually I say that the land grab is going on in Africa is just similar to that Berlin conference in 1800s when the European met to make the decisions to divide the continent the African was not on the tables today when there's land grab you may be you call it in Addis Ababa in Accra in wherever that it is taking place the indigenous people are not included and the decisions which are being made by these regimes well impact these people generation to come. That's why I call it live grafts, not land grafts. Most of the time, in these countries, if you rent a car, sometime 
more than three pages, you can sign in more than four places. In Africa, we don't see the contract for a land that lives for 99 years. We don't even know what is into that. And the problems, when you look at it, it's not the outsiders alone. Usually people say that when you point the fingers, the three fingers come back to you, the one that go to the other ones. So it is us, the Africans. It is our leaders, autocratic leaders, that who are causing the pain and the misery of the continent. These unelected groups are the one that inviting the investors. All of us come to this room through that door or that door, but if no one has opened this door, we would never get in. How did the Chinese come in? How did the Indian come to Africa? There was someone who invited them. The African leaders who were not elected by Africans. The elite who control the lands. In Ethiopia, the only thing you own as a owner of the house is the only house. Even the land where your house is, is not yours. So how do we say that the local people can become self-reliance? I seen that these regimes, they see their own people as obstacles. And this is the, con the problem that's going on today in the continent. So in conclusion, I think that we have something to, to do, each one of us. I led an organization for Ethiopian. It's called Solidarity Movement for New Ethiopia. And one of the problems is we are really saying that we want to create an Ethiopia where our humanity comes first. That, I think, applies to all of us. We cannot feed Africa all for many years by the use aid. Carol talk about civil society. There's anti-charity proclamation in Ethiopia where it's against the law for woman right, re disabled right, reconciliation, the right that which is the fundamental right that the West is founded on. Not many people, including USAID, say something about it. In Ethiopia, to be a journalist, you will be accused of being a terrorist. Not many people speak about it. One thing we can say that because the Western look at Ethiopian regime as ally on war on terror. As long as he can terrorize their own people and protect our, our interests, okay. That is against human value. That's why I say that the whole global society can be healthy when we see the humanity of each one of us. The problem of Africa is the problem of all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oban. Uh, very interesting and, and, and nice piece of film there to give us a real on-the-ground sense of uh, how this can have an impact. Uh, before we open it up for questions on the floor, I, I actually think it might, uh, you know, take the right of the chair to, to ask a first question because you made reference to a responsible investment. Uh, we, we've seen what the, the, the horrible downside, of what can happen as this is playing out in the Gambela region there in Ethiopia. And, and we have been there and seen that. Uh, but but there, is, there is another side, or at least there should be another side, <coughs> how this unfolds. Because as Obang said, he's not against investment. Investment is needed in Africa for growth. Uh, so, so, so what is responsible investment? <laughs> Uh, so responsible investment would be investment that, in mm. fact, uh, takes the time to understand that there usually are people <clears throat> on the land, whether you see them or not, who, are, who have use rights to that land, uh, and would recognize those use rights as absolutely central and vital to the livelihoods of the people on the ground. Uh, responsible investing would take more account of how you can actually involve local people in the commercial activity that's, that's ongoing. Um, and that could mean training more local people. Uh, it could mean providing e an equity stake in s to some extent in an investment to local communities. Um, it would probably mean more than just drilling a borehole and building a school. Uh, the private sector shouldn't necessarily be providing the public services that government should provide, but the private sector, um, if it's going to be accessing, in some ways, the patrimony of local people, the land should be 
should be attentive to um, providing more more meaningful opportunities for those people because it's exactly right when these people lose their land in concessions in most countries they lose it in perpetuity they're not getting it back uh, so the losses are are dramatic can be dramatic um, and the compensation tends to be tends not to match the kind of loss that people are suffering so so investors need to understand what are the what are the costs that they're um, imposing on local peoples and be more attentive to um, addressing those losses. Um, another thing that struck me coming out of the uh, the film as well was the uh, was the price that was cited of 150 pounds uh, 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 per week. I think it said for for this huge concession of land. Uh, one would think that if there was a huge amount of money being made off of an Indian or Chinese or whoever doesn't matter investor coming into the country, and that huge amount of money was being turned back to the public good, uh, that uh, that there would be less objection to it. But that doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, the government of Ethiopia doesn't seem to make make any money off of this. Uh, it's a remarkable thing. I, is this a pattern? Is this just in Ethiopia that that's been happening? Uh, how uh, how does this play out? I, I don't know. I actually just don't know what concession rights are are generally from country to country. You've just been in Mozambique. You probably have a good sense of there. But uh, but whether this this kind of uh, I mean, selling for that amount of money, uh, or or leasing, or whatever the arrangement arrangement is, is just uh, a, a a crime, as Obang said, uh, to to do it uh, in my mind. Uh, so let's... so one thing I'll, I'll just say quickly. One thing that would be very useful in this area is to have something akin to the extractive industries publish what you pay <coughs> campaign. So a publish <clears throat> what you lease. Um, campaign might actually be beneficial because, as I think all three of us have mentioned, we don't really know what are what's in some of the what's in virtually all of the concessions, and, and in some cases we shouldn't know, right? There there could be good reasons. Maybe there's proprietary information in some of the the contractual leasing, but to shine more of a spotlight on those arrangements so that we understand is this an extortionary deal or is this a meaningful deal that's going to help the communities on the ground or help the society at large by bringing more revenue into government coffers mm. would be really valuable, I think. But but at, in many countries, that's very problematic, and journalists like Obang face serious constraints to uh, to communicating this, to either getting the information or certainly to communicating the information. Okay. Well, here, let, let me stop and let's open it up. Uh, remember, we are being webcast live, so when I recognize you, wait for a microphone to arrive before you ask your question and identify yourself when you do. We'll start here with the lady in front, the lady on the side, and uh, right in the middle back there. <laughs> Uh, my name is Binta Terrier. I have an NGO called Partnership League for Africa's Development. Uh, my question is to Carol. Uh, how can you have a responsible investment if land right is not well defined? Well, so that's, I mean, that's a real challenge, right? And so much of what we're doing is trying to work with um, governments uh, in around the world to try to provide much greater security for communities whose rights are traditional or customary. Um, because if you don't have that strong, that strong right to the land, you're in a weak position negotiating with potential investors. And, and this is a challenge, right? Because it's asking the government to give up some authority and control it's had for a period of time, sometimes for 50, 60 years, sometimes for longer and give that control to local folks. And once you give the control of the resources legally to local people, in a way you set up a, government, a governance and government challenge, right? You create alternative competing sources of power and authority. In a sense, they're already there, but so you have to, rec you're right, you have to recognize the rights. Okay, so this G, whatever. G the G8's new alliance. Is, okay. <laughs> the, instead of trying to resolve something that is not really solvable. Why not try to work toward having a land right well defined in Africa? Because if I understand in my history books, the US and the UK, all these countries get development through property right. So if you, if this organization is trying to solve this problem in Africa, I think we should first deal with the land right issue. Have that defined and then make people understand that if you buy land in Africa, with the instabilities of the government, even though you've signed a 99-year contract, when the government sh uh, changes, you have no more right because you're going to be booted out of there. We see that happening all the time. 
So I think it's encouraging, actually, that every one of the new alliance countries recognized that land was an issue for their for them for the national governments from a governance perspective. Um, and this is a, this is a new rather new development. Land has not really been at the center stage of development efforts for a, for a long time, frankly. Uh, so for land, a complex, challenging, socially wrought issue to really be at the center of development debates is a good thing, and it but it will take time to um, to engage in the kind of reform efforts that are needed to really protect the property rights of people on the ground. But I think it's encouraging, actually, that it's it is in the center of the agenda. Okay, let's take uh, two or three questions at a time so we get uh, some more people being heard, and then make your questions kind of short. <laughs> Connie. Connie Freeman, I am with Syracuse University lecturing at this point. I was delighted to hear Obang identify the connection between the 2008 food crisis context and the increase in the land grabbing in Africa. Because this is another form of what is an old traditional problem, which is outsiders coming in and commanding African resources without paying an adequate price or making an adequate contribution. That's what colonialism was all about. But there's an inherent tension here, which is the world needs more food, and Africa has the land to produce the food, and traditional agriculture has not historically been very productive. And so something needs to come together now to solve that fundamental problem. My question for the panel is, what creative thinking is going on beyond just trying to make outside investors more responsible? Are there ideas of cooperatizing traditional farmers so that they become more productive? Are there ways to try to help governments to ask for better deals. After all, that's what they learned to do with the Chinese. Thank you. Okay. And the next question I saw was right there in the middle. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Mackenzie Rockliffe. I was recently an intern at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, but I also studied conservation management at the University of Maine. So I was interested in the demand. You mentioned conservation as a factor, but it seems to me that maybe there might be different dynamics or problems or management issues with that kind of land use versus the others. Um, so I just was wondering if you saw those or if there were differences around the world the way governments had responded to particularly conservation. Okay, and then I saw, um, yes, straight down front here with Steve. Yeah. Hi, Steve Landy, Manchester Trade. I, what I'm hearing is a problem of abuse vis-a-vis -vis the fact that the people who farm the lands don't own the lands, don't have rights to land. The basic idea of setting up commercial agriculture does not seem bad to me. That's the whole secret of economic interplay. If it's a higher value added, if it's more <laughs> productive comparative advantage, it's how U.S. and other places folk. Obviously, we screwed the Indians, so you're right. <laughs> so the question I guess I'm really trying to pose is if we could reform and assure that the people who are on the land get back something and so on is compensated, are you against the idea of shifting from food crop to commercial crops? Or do you also have problems making that switch because it distorts social values. Let me stop there because I'm really interested in your view. And you, I think you got my question and mm. so on is what I'm aiming at. Thank you. Okay, that's uh, Andy Manchester Trade. Okay, thank you, Steve. Yeah, three good questions. Maybe we'll start with Obama on the end and get, let Carol take a little bit of a rest here. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> yeah, I think that you mentioned uh, a very good point. I think even when Carol was talking earlier, what he said about this, he said involuntary guidelines. It doesn't have anything. It's just saying that there's a law there. Like if any one of us are driving, they're saying that there's a law there, but you can run a light, red light not being its stop. It's meaningless. And also this is supposed to apply to a countries where they don't respect the right of their peoples. 
would be just like another thing that you ask any African dictator, no one will ever say that we are not democrats. Everyone will say that rule of law, equality, justice, anything that that the term they use. So I don't think anyone has come up with a creative way. Even with the new alliance initiative that Obama has done just recently, as long as they don't you know, really put the peoples, in most of these cases, the people who are in, affected are not included. They are excluded. The deals are being made by the regime, autocratic regimes who see their people as obstacles. We have to put the people there. Even if you look at, you know, for example, the USID, and I could say that Carol can elaborate more on this. Now the investment or, you know, the development, the money they give in Ethiopia, they stop talking about the issues, which is freedom, rule of law, equality, justice. As you know that Ethiopia is going down the hill. But you don't hear that. Recently, we signed a petition to the USID where the government of Ethiopia, we heard they used that funding for a bill graduation, but that money is the one that comes through the U.S. We never get any response back. My point here is I think no one has ever really come up with the creative. But no matter what that creative is, as long as the regime doesn't mm -hmm. respect the right of their people, nothing will work. And coming back to you, question as you said that we are not again it's investment but investment that in, don't include the people is meaningless these are people who need to feed their family like those who are coming to grow the food in it so also we are not you know cash crops for example let me put that in ethiopia if you look according to the video even what the guy said that we will hire the peoples in there's a Saudi company in the Gambela regions. They hire 800 peoples. Out of 800 people, only 11 are from the indigenous local people. At some point, the Indian company want to bring Punjabi, 10,000 Punjabi from India to come to work in Ethiopia. Okay, are Ethiopia not capable to work? Of course not. So we, when I say that we are not against the investments, I mean it in literally that pushing these people away so that we can grow food to feed the Saudi or to feed the Indian is unconscionable, it's unacceptable, it's immoral and wrong. So we are not against that. The transforming the agricultures to benefit the local people is excellent. And I want to end it by this. Can you imagine what is being done in Ethiopia, being done in Bismarck, North Dakota, <laughs> in Saskatchewan, Canada, in Oxford, England, or New Delhi, India? If it's not allowing those people, place, it should not be allowed in that place. So that's what I mean by comparing to, to the, your point. So the overall thing is it come back to each one of us taking responsibility, saying that everything is wrong and this is wrong anywhere else. It come back to us. This is not just something extra. We are talking about life. Someone want to raise their kids. Someone want to feed their family. Someone want to have a better for their own people. That we have the responsibility. At the end of the day, the African have the responsibility. It is the Ethiopian to create a government of Ethiopia that respect the Ethiopian, that will give the law that respect the property light of Ethiopian people. And for that reason, Ethiopian will do that. But us will support that. And what we always ask as it, on behalf of the Ethiopian, we don't want the Western to be the one to free us. We are not asking the Washington to free us, but we are asking them not to be a roadblock to our freedom. Simple as that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Michael? Uh, let me go to the very first question about uh, what can we look to other than responsible investment here. I, I really, I'll probably repeat what others have said. Above all, we need better governance in the go from the governments hosting these investments. Uh, I mean, they need to step up and protect their people's interests. That's what it comes down to. And I think it's we need to keep in mind here that uh, host governments are going out of their way to invite investors to come into these countries. This is not like what was happening centuries ago uh, when you know, you'd know you have colonial powers coming in, guns blazing, and essentially doing what they wanted to do. These host governments are going out of their way to provide all types of tax benefits, all types of incentives. Uh, some countries, Pakistan comes to mind, uh, has actually provided a or has offered a private security force 
uh, of 100,000 people uh, to outside investors, to Gulf investors. So these, these host governments are so desperate for this investment, and you can't blame them. Agriculture needs infusions of investments. Uh, so what I'm trying to say here is they, there, there really are no incentives for these governments, many of whom tend to be uh, somewhat undemocratic, some of them corrupt, not much of an incentive for them to uh, do much at all in terms of telling the investors that they need to be more responsible. But that's what it comes down to. And these host governments need to pass laws, or they need to uh, uphold and enforce laws that are theoretically on the books governing how foreign how foreigners can invest in uh, in, in land in these countries. Um, so, and I don't think, I don't personally don't agree with uh, the whole notion of codes of conduct, uh, essentially the, the idea of regulations being formulated to guide how investors should should invest in, in, in land. It's, it's good from a normative perspective, but uh, when it comes down to it, uh, why would an investor, a very powerful, uh, wealthy investor, or uh, governments in host countries who really are just looking for investment and to pocket some of uh, a lot of the money that comes out of it, why would they want to listen to bureaucrats in Geneva or elsewhere uh, who are, you know, making some uh, statements that don't have any sort of legal uh, teeth or anything like that. I think it's a good idea in general, uh, in, in principle, but really it comes down to the host governments more than anything else. Okay. Uh, Carol, yeah. uh, and, and you pick up the conservation question yet Thank you. as well. Um, l let me just respond to Steve first. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, no, I don't think that 70% of the population of sub-Saharan Africa should be subsistence farmers in perpetuity. No. Um, so is commercial farming per se bad? No. Commercial farming is not per se bad. Um, I think the question really to grapple with is the one that Connie brought up, and that is, okay, if there needs to be a, str a significant increase in productivity in sub-Saharan Africa especially, how can, how can commercial agriculture, biz, commercial agribusiness, work with smallholder farmers in a meaningful way to get them to produce more so that more of them can actually get out of farming and do other stuff. It shouldn't be the case that everybody wants to, you know, we, in our past, not everyone wanted to be a farmer forever. Not everyone wants to be a farmer forever in Africa also. So how can you link those smallholders to a um, robust value chains where s value is being added within countries so that people are benefiting from processing and other kinds of production. Yeah, I think that's the key, and I think that's part of the answer for Connie's question. You, you have to go back and think through how can we create um, more, more appropriate outgrower schemes, uh, how can we get more, uh, better, more better inputs into the hands of smallholders? How can we get more credit? How can we get better warehousing? How can we use warehouse receipts as leverage to get access to better inputs for smallholders? So there's a lot of stuff that has to go on to transform that sector in Africa from a subsistence platform where it is now to a more commercialized platform. And that'll happen in part because of the urbanization, probably. So as more and more Africans move into cities and the demand to provide food in cities rises, there's, there's a sort of natural push to commercialize that sector anyway. There's a question about how it commercializes, though. That's the real problem that Obang has been talking about. OK, how do you commercialize so that the people who are on the ground are not just left behind in that process? Um, and, you know, having a lot of attention through events like this and other events on this issue hopefully will bring about more of a focus on the kind of responsible investing that we've all been talking about. Um, so to talk about the conservation just, just quickly, uh, yeah, it's obviously a very different kind of land use from agribusiness or from extractives. Uh, but, you know, interestingly, in some countries, people will say, God, conservation, you're not using the land. If you're not using the land, what's the point of putting it aside? So conservation, conservation is, um, is seen as a benefit by many governments only when there is substantial tourism dollars that are, that are attached to that conservation. So conservation without uh, some economic benefit from the conservation uh, is is in a weak position vis-a-vis -vis the demands from extractive industries or the demands from agribusiness or other demands for land acquisition. 
Uh, so conservation um, advocates are, are in a challenging position having to argue that the benefits from this land use, which really looks like non-use to most people, that this land use is really something that's worth uh, worth people protecting and um, whether, it, especially in cases where you don't have a lot of tourists going in. So, so there has to be, I think, a, again, you can do the same sort of thing here that maybe um, I, would, I was talking about earlier. When local people have more direct rights to be involved in the management and the benefit from the use of conservation assets, then you tend to see more robust results in terms of conservation outcomes. And you, you see some good, even some good tourist revenue uh, generated. And so Namibia by far is the best example of this in sub-Saharan Africa, gold standard excellent in terms of community conservations. Okay. okay, we've got time for another round of questions. The first hand I saw was right over here by you there, Derek. Yeah. My name is Antoinette Sebastian, and just by way of commercial, um, I have no known affiliation, but I am <laughs> a, a researcher and a contributing author to a, a handbook um, of land and water grabs in Africa, which was published um, or will be in December of this year. Uh, by Rutledge. But I, I guess one of my concerns, and I believe that there's a question here, is that we really sort of focused on food and agriculture, but I haven't heard any uh, statement from any of the panelists. And, and there are moral issues. And Obang, I'm fascinated that you said it wouldn't be tolerated if it happened here. And in fact, it is tolerated, the lack of transparency. I bet there's no one sitting in this room who really clearly knows what the deals were cut in the Gulf waters that belong to the United States for international oil companies, multinational oil companies. So it does happen here. It's just that there aren't a whole lot of people being displaced, but there are people being impacted. It happened in um, Middle America when Nestle decided it wanted to tap water resources in order to expand. And it was only because a journalist got a hold of it and, and managed to bring it to the attention of the town. So these things happen all the time, not to mention eminent domain. You want to build a new stadium. You want to protect coastal resources. It happens in a variety of places. The big difference, of course, is that the, the, the pain is very small, and this is uh, not communicated very well. But I, I guess the question I really have is that if we weren't talking about food security, and I'm not sure that we are, what, th there's a geopolitical aspect to all of this from my perspective. There's a, a and you mentioned that you tapped just a little bit, Obang, on the, the, the issue of security, the relationship between Ethiopia and the United States and the Horn of Africa. But there are other geopolitical vies for power that are ongoing that may or may not be directly associated with these land acquisitions. And I think that, Michael, you mentioned something about host governments. I think if, if you sort of pulled out the whole issue of democratization and human rights and you looked at what host governments are going to do, um, and why it's important for DRC, for example, to have positive relationships with South Africa or the dam in Ethiopia and having building relationships among the global south that don't necessarily include the global north. African countries, Latin American countries, building relationships among themselves that are separate and distinct in order to secure power, in order to secure arms, in order to secure positions on the Security Council, and I, I don't hear that as part of, of this conversation. So I, I think that it's interesting that the Indians want to, to and, and the Chinese and, and uh, the South Africans in Mozambique want land for agricultural production, but I also think that there's something else going on, and I was just wondering whether or not you could, any of you could speak to that. Sorry. Okay, that thank you very so much. Long. I uh, had a second question here and then a third question right in the middle there with Sheila. Thank you. Lulit Mesfun uh, with uh, Gimbot 7, a movement for democracy in Ethiopia. Uh, Obang, this is uh, a question for you. What role should the African uh, diaspora play in uh, uh, really highlighting this issue? Because at some point, all these companies are going to 
uh, Africa signing 99-year uh, leases, uh, where in the case of uh, you know, Ethiopia, as we know, there's an, an unelected dictatorship there, uh, giving uh, ancestral lands uh, to these companies. And at some point, uh, the next regime should not be able uh, to, um, we're not, we shouldn't be responsible uh, for what uh, this regime um, signed. And so uh, at some point, if these lands are nationalized, um, the US government or Europeans are going to be involved. So w what role should the African uh, diaspora play in highlighting this issue? Okay, thank you very much. And a third question before we start our answers. Right there, yep. Uh, my name is Emmanuel. I work with Oxfam America. I have two questions, one for Caro and then another one for Michael. Uh, Caro, can you be more specific? What do you mean uh, when you say that you said is working to support the implementation of the VGs under the new alliance? And um, for Michael, you noted that the environmental impact in Latin America associated with the land grabs is quite minimal. And I, wa I was interested in hearing if you have tried to explore more what kind of crops or what kind of land use is the land being put to. Because I would really think that um, from the discussion that has been going on, if it is the kind of large commercial farming that is, be that is being implemented in most farms, then it certainly would involve transformation of ecosystems, use of fertilizer and something like that. How would that one not have some environmental impacts in the short term and probably even the long, um, in the long run and even probably in the short term? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, why don't we, uh, the first question is a, is a pretty broad one and, and maybe everyone will like to take a little stab at it. So why don't we start with the last three questions which were directed at individuals. Uh, Michael, that last one at you, I think maybe you can start this time on, uh, you know, what land use is being put to and then Carol, pick up the question on the USAID VGTs and then, um, and then the diaspora role, uh, Obang, if you'll address that and then we'll, we'll take the first question last and everybody can talk to it or not. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's a good question about <coughs> Latin America. I think that in response to the question, why are we, why is there not as much uh, destruction or threat of destruction uh, in the environmental context, I actually think it's because, first of all, there have not been as many deals, uh, transactions in Latin America as there have been in, in Asia and, and Africa. But I think more importantly, as I had said before, a lot of these um, acquisitions have been not for not direct acquisitions they're more for stocks asset holding and speculation uh, so in fact a lot of these deals in Latin America have not really involved much farming uh, it's been more speculation you have private investors who have, are essentially just sitting on the land not doing anything with it they haven't converted it they haven't done anything they're just holding on to it because land prices are so favorable uh, for investors so Obviously, if you're not going to be doing farming, you're not going to be causing as many environmental problems. So I think that's, that's uh, it's a good question. I'm trying to get more into it a bit more myself, but I think that's, that's the main reason why, just because there's not a tremendous amount of, uh, of actual agriculture, a lot of, uh, an actual amount of farming going on uh, there, especially relative to, uh, to in Asia and Africa. The land is such a speculative, it's such a tool of, of speculation. I'm probably not using the right term there, but uh, <laughs> essentially land is it's monotonized. Monotonized? Mono <laughs> Monopolized. <laughs> yes, there you go. Thank you. Um, so it really is a matter of essentially investors just sitting on the land, not doing with it. And you can't, you're not going to cause, you're going to have cause other problems, but you're not going to necessarily cause problems for the environment that way. Okay. Carol, would you like to? Sure. Uh, so thank you for the question on the VGs and the new alliance. Um, the six new alliance countries, uh, which are Ghana, I think, I think I'm right on Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Mozambique, um, have, made, have made specific policy commitments around improving land governance in their countries. And in addition, they've, made, um, they've agreed to take into account uh, the guidance of the voluntary guidelines and the uh, principles of responsible agricultural investment. So um, I'll speak from the land tenure division's perspective. What implementing the VGs means for us uh, is working in those and other countries uh, with host governments um, and with communities to identify the boundaries of their lands, their traditional lands in many cases, and to create a system where use rights, formalized use rights, can be issued to communities 
or to families, in the case of families, recognizing the rights of both husbands and wives on certification or titling documentation, uh, so that it's not just a male head of household who's recognized, but it's both a, ma a man and his spouse or his partner who are recognized as holders of legal rights to land. So much of our work, um, and, and this comports with the voluntary guidelines, the voluntary guidelines place a strong emphasis on recognition and respect of existing rights. How do you recognize and respect the rights? You do that by formalizing them so that there's a, a legal document attached to the rights or there is information in data systems, land management information systems about Carol holding this land and Steve holding other land and having particular rights to the land. Or if I'm a pastoralist, perhaps my rights to access Steve's land occasionally to graze my animals or get to water sources is recognized. Recognizing things like pastoral rights is a, is a tremendous challenge. Um, it's been done in a number of West African countries. It's a huge issue in East Africa. So sometimes implementing the voluntary guidelines means recognizing the rights of particularly vulnerable populations like pastoralists to have their traditional migratory corridors protected or to have access to pasture lands secured or access to water sources secured. Increasingly, pastoralists have very difficult times uh, maintaining their access to water because, at least in Africa, a significant amount of the land acquisitions that are going on are also taking water resources. Um, and, and that really is particularly problematic in areas where there are large pastoral community. So it's, so it's about helping to recognize the rights of people on the ground so that they are empowered. Um, it's about, in a way, democratizing land rights. Land rights are not democratized right now. Uh, so how can we exchange the property franchise in a way that will decentralize power and authority and lead to more equitable, more open and transparent governance? But what we've been hearing, of course, about the situation <clears throat> Excuse me, in Ethiopia, Carol, uh, would because uh, you put Ethiopia on your list of voluntary guidelines uh, um, uh, adherence. Uh, what what sort of enforcement mechanism do you have? I mean, what, yeah, so actually they're we, not taking into account the rights of at least people in Gambela. What? Uh, yeah, Gambela is a it's it's a really difficult it's a really difficult region. Um, we've been working in Ethiopia since 2004 with the government uh, and supported the process of providing uh, more secure use rights to smallholder farmers starting in Tigray region in the highlands uh, over the course of the past um, several years since 2004 uh, have supported government efforts to certify land use um, in four in four highland areas and are now working um, starting to work with the government to secure rights for pastoralists. So it's a slow process in Ethiopia in 2003 you couldn't use the word private the words private property. Uh, today, there actually are growing lease markets for land. Farmers can lease in and lease out lands, particularly useful for women. So it's not to say that there are not problems in that country, uh, but there have been some positive changes as well. Okay. And um, uh, Obang, if you want to pick up that uh, diaspora question, I think. It'd be okay. Uh, thank you, for, for Luli. Uh, before I go to that, I think that I go back to your point. What you're saying is... Uh, I think you mentioned a very good uh, point. Right now, the continents of Africa, there's many players that's wanting it. Uh, for instance, one thing sometimes we don't look at, I think Steve brought this up earlier. And when you look at some of this land deal, land acquisition, it doesn't look like the investors or this country are benefiting a lot from them. But I also they think there's another way that these autocratic regimes who are vulnerable, they will use these governments to support them financially or to give them some kind of support. And I think that is obvious in terms of China. China now is all over Africa. And they have the argument where they say that, you know, we are not the same as the West. The way the Western brought development to Africa, it never works, but the Chinese way will work. But Chinese are bringing something with them as well, as well, which is the human right. They don't give a damn about the human right. Uh, and if you look at it, even in now in Ethiopia, the Chinese are giving 
the technologies to jam radio, like for example, the BOA, Boy of America. Like and now, if they have a program tomorrow and they say that there's this good program tomorrow, the government will jam it. So in other words, the government may give Chinese the land, so the like, Chinese will give the technology to Ethiopia. So in other words, there's that competition, even when you see now Africa going to Africa, the, you know, the Chinese looking at this as a problem. So that security is there. Uh, African Union, I'm sorry if some people say it, I don't really, it, I think it's a, you know, a union of dictator for life. Until it's reformed, nothing. Uh, so there's a competition going on in terms of the security in the continent. And, and these problems is also is coming in terms of investment, the people who are investing in. Because if there's a, a dictator government that they will get the support in terms of money from the Middle East, if they, you know, from the, or in terms of technology from China. So there's these things that are going on. So the security you mentioned is very good. Uh, how do you solve that problem? I think the African have to be really, uh, according to the uh, Freedom House, Africa is the most unfree continent on earth today in terms of human freedoms. So for that factors, it will make it that, you know, as long as the local people remain, you know, oppressed, the government will make a deal with these people. So there will be a competition between them. So the same things as what's happening now. You don't hear that much. I've been here testified at the U U.S. Congress. You don't hear so much about Ethiopia. You don't hear so much about Paul, Paul Kagame until recently. Or Museveni of Uganda. Why? Because, the, you know, they are the alliance or war on terror. The same thing now that you see that Ethiopia, what they are doing, what Ethiopia are doing, if that what Amadeja is doing, it will be all over. If you go Shaba is doing what Ethiopian is doing, it will be all over. So that the indifference to what I'm talking about earlier. So that security is still there. So it's how to solve it again, come back to the African, which is come back to my sister here, that the question you mentioned. At the end of the day, the problem of African is the African problem. You know, the diasporas, the failures, we fail to be organized in terms of the Ethiopian and the rest of the Africans. This is an issue that Africa has to address it in a well tangible way, laid it out. So this land we are talking about, look, we could see the example of Madagascar. The government want to give the whole land to the Korean. People say had enough. They are rose up, the government is over, it's finished. I think there's something that we could do. We don't need Carol, we don't need anyone, we don't need U.S. It is our home, it is our place, it's that where we are. To the outsider, the land is being, people have been displaced. To Ubang, my uncle has been displaced. Do you know, see how different that is? So it is our responsibility to be organized and make the people aware and second of all, to really put the guideline that no government will last forever, especially our democratic regime like Ethiopia that depend on begging. And when that government collapses, this land deal will not be binding. To leave the Indian know, to leave the ambassador know that. But we are not organized. They come back to you. The diaspora need to know that. This is a life and death situation. We have to be organized and speak out, and be the advocate for us, and letting us know that, again, like sister say was, you know, if it's not good, it's there and there. She said that, you know, the media is there. In Ethiopia, there's no media. She said that there's some law. In Ethiopia, we don't have law. Michael put it very well. Unless the African regimes, you know, the African people find a government that put their people first, this land deal will, acquisition will not stop. It, unless Ethiopian have an Ethiopian people elected, a government of Ethiopian for Ethiopian by the Ethiopian, that will put the law to protect the right of the Ethiopian, property right, this thing will not stop. So that requires her self-reliance, it requires her to mobilize, it requires her to say that at the end of the day, it is our problem, not the Western problem, or the Asian problem, or the outside problem. It is time for African to decolonize African from Africa. And that can come only from us. Yeah, thank you, Bang. We are just about out of time. I wonder if anybody else wants to pick up Antoinette's question on sort of the broader geopolitical aspects of security. 
issues, yeah. Yeah, sure. I could I could weigh in on that a bit. I think mm -hmm. absolutely uh, this land acquisitions trend should be seen within the broader context, for example, of uh, Sino-India strategic competition for resources. Um, it's for a number of years, uh, China and India have been competing in the Indian Ocean region for energy resources. Uh, India has a rising profile on the world stage. It's trying to quote unquote, catch up with China. China has been increasing its investment in Africa and Latin America for a number of years, not just in terms of agriculture, but in terms of energy, infrastructure. And only since then has India then been getting involved in these types of things as well, in those in, in, in the likes of Africa and uh, Latin America. So I think you, that's, that's definitely the case. Also, uh, China is very involved in land uh, deals in Southeast Asia. This is tied to the Chinese strategic uh, objective of increasing its influence in that part of the world, absolutely. Uh, and pa I would say very strongly that Pakistan is very happy to relinquish land to Gulf states uh, because it has very important relations with these states, especially Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the country that's seen as the one that's most interested in, in, in investing in, in land in Pakistan. Saudi Arabia is a critically important in, uh, country for Pakistan's strategic interests for reasons that I don't need to go into. Uh, so there's that. Um, but, you know, I'd also say that there, there are very local motivations here that have absolutely nothing to do with geopolitics. I mean, India, for example, um, I've spoken with people in India who tell me that the Indian corporations that we're seeing going abroad now to do their to do their activities, Karaturi and Ethiopia and the like. What they really want to do is focus more on agricultural production at home in India, but they're running into so much resistance and they're also running out of land that they could use that they just decide to take their act abroad. So that has nothing to do with uh, with, with politics. But you're right. I mean your point is the point uh, the point made was correct, but I think it's also necessary to see it as locally determined as well. Yeah, thank you. Carol, any closing remarks? I think I'll leave it at that. That was okay. Thank you very much. Well, join me in thanking this very good panel. I thank you all for coming out as well.